All right. Well, I am I'm going to try and be relatively quick today because we it, it has been a long day and I'm very aware that I'm uh, nearly nearly the last thing between uh, now and and some uh, it sounds like some drinks so when I was looking at this I thought what would a bunch of people who were sitting in this sort of uh, in this sort of situation want to know there was probably going to be some practitioners there's probably going to be some people who are at, at uh, companies and there's probably going to be some people who are associated with projects so on a concrete basis what is useful now I used to think I used to say that pretty much no one would ever sue an open source developer or an open source project for uh, for patent infringement largely because there was no money um, this is why the recent lawsuit against uh, by RPI against GNOME is really surprising because uh, I really am not sure what they're going to get about it. They're, they're going to get out of it. But thinking about this, I thought for all those of, of you who are not intimately familiar with, with sort of the, the, the patent dance and how it goes forth, um, patents have, there are sort of reasons why people get patents and we, reasons why people en enforce them. The only thing a patent really gives you is the right to exclude. You don't get the right to do anything. You only get the right to try and prevent other people from doing things. Uh, the other thing is that you can, if people don't agree voluntarily to, to what they, to stop whatever it is that you say that you're the exclusive person that can do, you can really only sue them. That's the power that is given you by, uh, by patent. Now, sue, the power to file a lawsuit is a, pretty powerful, uh, is a pretty powerful club. Patent lawsuits, sometimes called the sport of kings because it is very, very expensive. But why do various organizations have patents? And really, it comes down to one of three models. Uh, the first is, and this is one of the, this is sort of the original thought for most people, is that uh, we have figured out a better way of doing X, Y, Z. We've figured out, out a better process. We've figured out a better machine. We want to stop other people from doing that. That's the classical use of patents. Honestly, I don't see it very often, but it does occur. The second is uh, patents are a source of revenue. This is people who really want to license out their, license out their patents. Uh, you'll see this frequently. You, it will, the, those who pursue this sort of strategy will have frequently lots and lots of patents or a very small but very thoroughly researched and vetted portfolio. The third one, you frequently say, hear organizations say something like, we only have patents as an insurance, uh, as we only do them defensively. Really, what they're thinking about this is they're thinking about it really implicitly as an insurance policy. They're trying to preserve their own freedom of action. And they're saying, if we have these sorts of assets and other people try and, uh, try and come at us for revenue or to prevent us from doing something that they say they're the only ones who allow it, if we have things that read on their products as well, we can go into this sort of trade and, and instead of having to stop what we're doing or having to pay them money. We essentially trade licenses and we both go on, go on our merry way and we compete in the marketplace. So why in the world would a patent holder assert against a, a free or open source project? And I think it would really come down to two main reasons. And the first is if a FOSS project has implemented an important proprietary or FRAND licensed standard feature. Uh, this is one of the things that it was originally said about uh, free and open source software, especially originally, was that it wasn't good at innovating, it was only good at copying. Uh, in the case where you do have something where you have essentially taken an important uh, something or other and, and copied it, that, that might actually be a reason for someone to try and enforce a, a, a patent against against a project. The second is when you've got a, a project that is being used to make money. Uh, and in this case, you will usually not sue the project, you would usually sue the people who are making the money because they're the ones that have the money and really that's what you want to have happen. GNOME doesn't fit any of these profiles. And so that's why I said it, the lawsuit doesn't make any sense. Why do I think it's out there? 
honestly, I think that they were sloppy. Um, I think that they found something and they, uh, they filed off another lawsuit because it was cheap and easy to do so and they didn't really vet vet who was on the other side of that lawsuit. But I think that they are the exception that ends up proving the rule. So I'm going to assume some things about the people in this room. And really, this has to do with the idea of what are we doing preserving freedom? And it's very similar, uh, ac similar to what a company thinks about when they, pres when they say, we want to preserve freedom, uh, our, our uh, freedom to operate. The things that we talk about in terms of software freedom really parallel very closely this idea of a corporation's freedom to operate. And what that usually results in is we want to avoid these sorts of issues, or if we can't avoid them, how do we dispose of them as quickly and easily and cheaply as possible? Uh, I'll also assume that most of the corporations that are involved in free and open source software development are usually thinking about the patents in terms of the insurance model. They're trying to also preserve their own freedom, freedom of operation. So I'm going to give just a couple points about what would you do concretely to try and maintain or mitigate patent risk. The first thing and the overall point that I want to make is that patents, dealing with patents, is really a community risk management problem. If you are not thinking about it in terms of risk, you're thinking about it the wrong way, full stop. Uh, because if you get spun around the axle of saying patents, 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 we can debate whether patents are good or bad until the cows come home and it won't do any good and it won't get any free software created. Uh, it also doesn't, it doesn't actually create a risk. What it does, or it doesn't actually uh, make that risk actually land. All that happens is that you've accomplished doing a lot of talking. Think about what are the actual concrete risks that you're going to face and how are you going to face them and is it an acceptable risk? Uh, this is nothing more than they, we sometimes talk about the bus factor on projects or the open source maturity model or various other ways of thinking about risk in a project. Patent risk is no different. So number one, I think that there are areas in which you really need to be a lot more cognizant of patent risk. And in thinking about those and trying to characterize them, I think it is where software starts to interact very closely with hardware. Uh, these are places such as codecs. These are places such as uh, sometimes very low level in the computer uh, drivers. These are places where you, a lot of times in mobile, these are places where you're trying to send particular, st particular things over the air or over a wire that, that fit a particular standards profile. This interface of software and hardware tends to be particularly rich with patents, uh, and they tend to be particularly core to a lot of those implementations. So if you're going to be doing something in this space, be careful and be wary. Uh, number two, Thing, places like OIN, other patent pooling organizations, can be very, very helpful in terms of helping mit mitigate your risk. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are involved in various things, but nevertheless have recognized that open source is important and they, they need to work with the broader, broader community. A lot of them are also licensees in, in OIN. Individual projects can also become licensees and thus become come under the patent, uh, patent umbrella for OIN. I've also heard it, heard it said um, that if you are in a substantial open source project, you can approach the, uh, the lot gr group and they may make an exception for the sorts of fees that they would otherwise require. Uh, number three, and I think that this is important, those who know me know that I am an advocate for CLAs because I think that involving the lawyers earlier is better rather than later. And in particular, I think that it's imp one of the reasons why you want a CLA is because you want an explicit patent grant from the, from the individuals, and particularly the individuals working for corporations that contribute to your project. Um, one of the reasons why I think that the DCO is difficult is because it ends up functioning legally like a sort of a substandard CLA one that notably doesn't grant any patent rights. Um, so 
I think that the uh, the Apache like the Apache standard Apache CLA is a good example. And if you're worried about this, or you you license out under a different thing, you can include the right to relicense under a particular particular license. Uh, in terms of your own project, now w there's a lot of back and forth about. Uh, and I would suggest uh, I would suggest there is in all of your materials uh, back uh, a couple different papers about patent licenses and open source and open source licenses and in the implicit patent licenses, et cetera. But if you really want to sidestep that entire discussion, use a license which has an explicit patent grant. It just makes it easier. Number f uh, number five is. It once you've got your project up and running, encourage, encourage corporate contributors, especially patent holding ones, to contribute to your project. If you follow the earlier uh, advice of having a CLA that grants patent rights, what you're doing is essentially creating an implicit patent pool, uh, patent pool defined by all the contributors, and it's going to be a lot easier to have people participate in that patent pool than it is to try and go to their legal group and say, we'd like to negotiate a patent cross license and we don't have any money because they'll just laugh you out of the room. But if you say, instead, we're going to participate in this project and in use, it's good for you, it's good for us, and we all are able to use it to make money, that also creates an, impl an implicit patent pool. Number six. Uh, I joke that, uh, I, I joke, but really this is about keep the money separate from the IP. Uh, that doesn't always work, witness no, uh, GNOME, but frequently you want to make sure that the, the, the code and the code holding organization is relatively unconstrained. You can do this just by, by separating it out and usually that ends up being a little bit cleaner from a community standpoint anyway. So, you've gone through all this, someone approaches you. Now, there are two ways in which you can be approached. There's a friendly way and an unfriendly way. The friendly way is when they talk to you first. The unfriendly way is when they sue you first. If they, if they approach you first, take allegations of patent infringement very, very seriously. Uh, you should, you should, this doesn't mean that every assertion is going to be valid. In fact, in, in my experience, many of them, or even the majority of them, end up not being valid for one reason of, or another. But you should have a documented, you should document either the non-infringement, or you should document here's how we work around the, the issues in the patent, or you should be ready to remove code if you just can't get around it. What about the unfriendly way? If you are threatened, be loud, don't, uh, don't get into a situation where your freedom to speak and to speak loudly and to make your point heard is, is uh, compromised. Because one of the things that, we, that happens in the free software community is that we are a community. If you are loud, if, you, if people perceive that you are being unjustly accused, they will step up. Again, witness what is happening with GNOME. It will be very. It will be much to your benefit. The other thing is that I'd like to note that it pays to be aggressive. Like I said, the majority of patent assertions end up falling by the wayside. Not all of them, but the majority of them. I like to say that one of the best ways to deal with some of these assertions is to be uh, be like a rabid dog. This is a picture from Wikipedia of of. A, a supposedly a rabid dog. And that is to say, communicate to the other side that you will be economically inefficient and irrational in terms of taking down their patent. Because usually what their whole goal is to say, hey, if you are, if, if this is going to cost you a million dollars, you can settle with us for 50,000 and we'll go away. If you say, we're going to break your business model and we're going to, no matter what it takes, we're going to try and invalidate your patent. That makes you a less, not as good a target. And in my experience, it will make people less likely to come at you in the future. The end.
think one important part of how this worked was that the free software movement never really hated patents, but it feared them terribly. And its fear was not necessarily based upon rational calculation. It was based upon programmers' belief that getting into a patent fight could cost you your house, your car, your sleeping bag dog, right? It was, a, it was a fear that economic power was going to run over creativity wholesale. And to some extent, I think your advice is wise. That is to say, there are times when the way to help frightened people deal with the patent situation in which they find themselves is to tell them, bulk up large, be noisy, be aggressive. It's not always the right answer. But what we really are measuring here is how important it is to have some lawyer who knows what's going on. Uh, and that, of course, was why SFLC came into existence, both to provide that lawyering and to train lawyers who would know how to deal with situations. I must point out that from time to time, my clients had needs or felt that they had needs which lie outside the range of the rationality you're talking about. Uh, clients came in and they said, so-and-so refuses to give us a freedom to operate letter with respect to the claims that so-and-so corporation has. We want you to sue them for us. And I need to spend an afternoon talking some guys off the ceiling because they're being too aggressive. They don't understand that they're not going to get a freedom to operate letter from Corporation X. That would cost Corporation X a lot of money. It would make things difficult for Corporation well, They're never going to do that. But there are a lot of other things that you could do to make peace with them that would at least convince you that they're not after your house, your sleeping bag, your car, or your dog. That is to say, they don't want to sue you. And let's go and have a conversation about that that will allow you to take informal assurance because you don't need formal assurance. This is part of what Terry and I were talking about before, about the importance of indemnity from suit and estoppel. There were many times when all we wanted to tell our client was, we have gotten a piece of paper from Corporation X, which shows that if Corporation X ever went and tried to get an injunction against you, it wouldn't work, because we would show the court that they promised you they wouldn't do it, and that's really all that we require. We're not a business. We don't require a patent license. We're not a business. We don't require an arrangement that will allow us to share royalties or in other ways to make a business deal. We just want to know that you're not going to kill us. And there are a lot of ways to get assurance that we won't kill you. Yeah. I think you're right that pooling was a really important innovation in that respect. When you say we could use a license that gives explicit patent grants, of course, that's what GPL3 was supposed to offer people. Everybody who comes into this project will not be able to betray us by suing us down the line about their claims. This is also your point about the CLAs. But, but it turns out that there are times when you don't even need to go that far. You just want an assurance from people that we understand that breaking free software developers is not important to us. This is why I believe we are now almost at perfect consensus about patents in the world. Free software movement doesn't have to hate patents anymore because it doesn't have to be afraid. The combination of the licenses that grant explicit rights, the CLAs which grant explicit rights, the pooling that grants explicit rights, the estoppels all over the world, the enormous number of companies, all of whom participate and want a level playing field and do not want to have to worry about rent seeking within the FOSS world, in various different overlapping ways, we're almost done. The only people left are people who don't understand or who don't care. And this is why the conversation we were having earlier this afternoon about the residual effort to deter NPEs is so important. I think 10 years from now, we won't be thinking about patents much at all. Do you agree? Mm, I'm not sure I'd go that far. Why? Because I think that a patent always ends up being defined by its boundaries. And I think that people can agree with everything that you said and nevertheless say, ah, but here's, here are the things that were within the boundaries and here are the things that were outside the boundaries. And the stuff I only, I only put into the open source world, the stuff that was, was outside the boundaries of my patent. Mm. Jim, did you want to say something?
Uh, to Evan, to your question about why he might think this will still be a problem, it still is a problem, and people were saying in 10 years it won't be a problem 20 years ago. Um, but Van, I guess I have a, a question for you. Not, not having spent any time deep diving the Rothschild matter, do we think that they might be hoping that the foundation does not have adequate resources and would consequently get inadequate prior art before the office so that when they go back for others later, the office has already seen that art on IPR. I doubt they've thought through it that far. Yeah, I mean, if you want to know what the intelligence says, Jim, I would say the intelligence says they screwed up and Van is right. I, I don't think that there's much thought behind this. I think this was careless, careless lawsuits. I, 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 I won't speak for Keith, uh, but I think it would say that from my point of view, these people didn't even really know what open source was or what Shotwell was. They had, a, they had a website search and they found something and they went for it because that's the way their business model works best for them. Okay, thank you very much.